service here this Sunday morning, and uh, we're going to continue our Bible study now concerning the judgment seat of Christ. And a judgment, now I remember when we first came to Walnut Grove, we uh, started a church in our home, and uh, we had uh, probably eight or ten people that uh, started out, and uh, anyway, uh, we had one family that when we got on uh, the judgment seat of Christ, the responsibilities of a Christian, they quit church. So, after a while, they came back, and we were up to 12 or 14, and for some reason or other, uh, I don't know what it was, but we were all Christian living again, and they left again. And uh, so, I don't know. Uh, you just wonder. But anyway, we know one thing. Every Christian, from the time that we are saved, I was going to have to give account of themselves for what they do for the Lord with their life because that's what God uses. Can't use a lost person to tell people how to be saved or the lost person would be saved themselves, you see. So, if you have uh, your outline that we gave you there, uh, we're going to go on and the one that we haven't covered yet concerning the judgment seat of Christ is 1 Corinthians here in chapter, in chapter 3 and in verses 11 to 15. So, Let's begin there. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, and precious uh, stones, or wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Verse 13. Now if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss of reward, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So, we're going to take each one of these verses and go right down through it, and then I think that helps explain it. First of all, when we start, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, at this judgment, since it's in heaven, only the Christian is there. Lost people are not there. The foundation that humanity and Satan want you to build upon, or any person in this world, is the foundation of water baptism, the foundation of good works, the foundation of our church, the one true church, Roman Catholicism. In other words, build upon that. You belong to our church. You're all set here because this is the one uh, true church. Upon this rock will I build my church. And they, of course, apply that to Peter. But we find out that the word and the stone and the rock is therefore a word that is the solid rock, not just a piece of rock like the word for Peter is. So it's this foundation. So the only one going to heaven is the one, and the reason it's the foundation, every other way to heaven is like sinking sand. That's why you put a foundation on the earth upon a building, because it's not going to sink and therefore you have a foundation to build upon. You build a skyscraper, you build a house, you build a home, whatever it is. The same <coughs> is in a spiritual sense. The foundation is only Jesus Christ, and the reason is very simple. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So in order to give you and I a gift, it has to be bought and paid for, and that concerns sin. God's not willing any of us should perish. He loved the world. God gave his only begotten son to come down to this earth to die upon that cross to pay for our sin so we don't have to go to hell and do it ourselves. Now, there have been many people who wondered, will they be judged for the sins that they have committed prior to salvation? And uh, we've all committed a few sins prior to salvation. And uh, I'm glad we're not going to be judged for that. No, you're not. But how do you know that? Well, let's go here, if you will. And we find out 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 makes that perfectly clear. It says here, 
that therefore if any man be in Christ, any man is a lost man, but if he's in Christ, he's a saved man. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Now, the word creature is the Greek word, it is this, and it's used as a noun. Its primary meaning is that of creating, whether it be of the world, whether it be of the universe, whether it be of a building, or whether it be of creation of people. So, it's used in that uh, whatever context it's used in, depending on the context. And here it should have been translated as creation. All right? The word new, which is the Greek kanos, and in which it has reference to a new time, a new nature, and that equals, therefore, a new person spiritually. Prior to being saved, humanity was identified and labeled as, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, and most of you already know this, and that is, in 1 Corinthians 2, 14, the Word of God tells us, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, but foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. At the moment, now just follow on down, at the moment that a person accepts the Lord Jesus Christ, we find out that they're indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God. And we find that in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, in whom you also trusted after that you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after that you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So every Christian has the Holy Spirit. That's very interesting. So you're a new creation because you were just a natural man. You were born with the old Adamic nature. But then when you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit, so you're not the same person. You're a person and a human being now, but the Holy Spirit of God was in you, and the Holy Spirit is the new nature. So, the next thing that comes on is the fact that that person at a new time, and that is, accepted Christ as Savior, became a new creation, now into what the Holy Spirit, and will never be confronted with any of the sins prior to being saved. Now, when it talks about here, old things are passed away, behold, all things become new, then we find out old things are all sins prior to salvation. You remember in Micah chapter 7 and verse 19, when he talks about when our sins are buried in the depths of the sea. Now, when they had in Jerusalem there, when they had the temple, and they offered the sacrifices there. The priests would slay the animals, and the blood would run down there, run into the brook Kidron. The brook Kidron would run on down into the Dead Sea. Now, Micah used that because Jerusalem is 2,600 feet above sea level. You'll find out that the Dead Sea is 1,300 feet under sea level, which is 3,900 feet, and you find out that the Dead Sea is... 1,300 feet deep. That's 5,200 feet, your sins, and Michael used that just as an illustration. So your sins are buried 5,200 feet to the bottom of the Dead Sea and the depths of the sea. That's why he used that to show. And then if you go and you go to Psalms chapter 103, 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. So... Are we going to have to give an account for anything we did before we're saved? No. They're removed as far as the east is from the west. They are buried in the depths of the sea. The only one that will remember what sins you've done prior to being saved is your buddies and your friends and your relatives. They probably will not let you forget too much <laughs> about some of the things that you've done prior to being saved, if you've ever done anything that... Uh, Maybe you shouldn't have done. Maybe one of the relatives got involved in something, you told them off and something said, keep your nose out of our business or something like that. And, uh, well, they'll, they'll remember that. We had a, a reunion, our a school reunion one year, and we went there, it's been a, seven or eight, nine years ago. 
And there was a fellow there that, uh, he was on the fire department in uh, Troy, Ohio, when I was on the police department. He was a good friend of mine. And uh, I'll be darned if he didn't bring something up. And uh, that had happened uh, during that time when I was on the police department. He brought something up. And, uh, or something, I guess it was prior uh, to being on the police department. But how in the world did he remember that? I don't know, but he surely did. And I'll tell you, there will be people that bring up something, but God never will. He will never bring up anything to you that you have ever done prior to being saved. Aren't you happy about that? I just wish other people would follow the example of the Lord, don't you? I really, I really do. Okay, well, let's go on down. Then he says here, old things are passed away. That's all since prior to salvation. And then are passed away, basically the Greek means to pass by, pass away, perish, and disregard. So, to the Lord, what you did prior to being saved doesn't mean a thing. Because right now, you're a brand new creation. <laughs> and that's wonderful, because now the only thing that we have to give an account for at the judgment seat of Christ is how and what we do with our life since we are saved. So, all things become new. All things become new in God's eyes as He keeps account of our life from the time we're saved until the time we leave this earth via the death or rapture. So, I'm happy about that. You know, you wouldn't know some of the things if once in a while we use them in an illustration or something like that. But uh, other than that, uh, <clears throat> we're home free as far as that's concerned, you know. Now, let's go on down. If any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, the gold, silver, and precious stones are characteristic of how we used our faithfulness, our abilities, and our life. For the Lord, the words uh, wood, hay, and stubble are representative of our unfaithfulness to the Lord. So, through those, we're going to suffer loss of reward. This involves a tremendous battle, and I want to bring something out because preachers screw up on this just almost inevitably. I remember we were uh, down at uh, Faith Baptist Church in uh, Perry, Ohio, and uh, Anyway, we had taught them that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, old things are passed away, all things become new. This is not how you look at things entirely, because all things haven't become new. You're a new Christian, you know that you're saved, but if all things became new, how would you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus? Have you learned anything since you've been a Christian? Well, if you've been in a good Bible teaching church, you've learned things. So all things have not become new the day that you got saved. What became new is you knew that you were a Christian because you trusted Christ, you knew that. But did you know anything about the rapture? Did you know anything about growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Did you know anything about what God wanted to do with your life? How he would lead you or that? Man alive, when I got saved, I had no idea that I would be up be behind a pulpit and be teaching the Bible. I had no idea about that whatsoever. Did I know the things, and God can take care of things if he wants to teach you a lesson or something, if you want to uh, sort of play games with him? After he, I knew that he called us into the ministry and going to church one night, and... Uh, we had been tithing our money, and uh, that particular night, I told Margie, I said, uh, you know, I said, I've held out Sunday morning and put my tithing in, so Sunday night, I'm still the Holy Spirit's well, this is my money. You owe it to me, Max. Isn't it funny how the Holy Spirit just sort of gives you a little hint, and a little shove, and a little push once in a while, you know? So anyway... I said, Lord, let, let me just say this. You don't understand. Now, if I'm going to Bible college, we've already decided we're going to Florida Bible College in Miami, Florida. Now, you know it takes money to go down there. Now, you know I've related to you that I'll go if I have a certain amount of money. So, I got to, this is a, you, you know, I got to add to my, uh, you know, got to add to my fund here to go down there. I mean, I'm taking my family. I got three kids. They're all young, <clears throat> don't have a place to live, don't know anybody down there. 
And I'm just up selling the home, and away we go now. I'm sure you understand. So, oh, Lord understood all right. So anyway, I didn't even make it to church, I guess. And all of a sudden, clang, and clang, and clang, and clang, and clang. And Marge said, what's that? I said, how do I know I'm not out of the car yet, Marge? You know, I've got a little testy with her. And uh, so we pulled it over, looked, and there's the muffler and the tailpipe. We got under there and looked, and it's dragging on the ground. So I said, uh, well, what is it, Max? I said, Margie, <coughs> don't bother me now. I get this taken care of. So I don't know why I had it, but I got in the trunk of my car, and I had a hatchet. I don't know why I had it in there, but I had a hatchet. So I looked under there and that, and now I'm dressed and threw an old something downtown or something. And I thought, well, you know, I can see there's just a little piece of metal still holding that on there. So if I twist that or get it, and I tried twisting it, you know, so I drop it off just open the trunk or maybe get rid of it, you know, so it wouldn't drag. I didn't have a muffler, but whatever. Uh, so we could go on. Well, I twisted that, and when you know, just a little piece there, that thing wouldn't break. That thing wouldn't break. And, and uh, well, how's it coming, honey? Well, honey, it ain't coming. That's what I was coming there, you know. And I'm getting more testier, you know, and uh, or like that, you know. And and then she's getting a little aggravated. Don't forget, I'm your wife. Yeah, I remember you're my wife. I wish you'd shut up for five minutes. Let me think this thing in here, you know. Now, I know none of you husbands would ever talk that way to your wife, you know, but uh, I haven't really been saved too long, you know. And uh, so anyway, I got my hatchet and climbed out of there and boom, like that, you know. And uh, somehow or other, I hit the gas tank. And when you hit the gas tank, you put a hole in it. One of the darn thing didn't explode or something. I smell gas, honey. I said, yes, honey, you smell gas because the gas coming out of the gas tank. Why is it coming out of the gas tank? I said, because they, uh, oh, Margie, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what, this is not good. I don't know why the Lord doesn't guide you to keep quiet, you know, while we take care of this, you know. Make a long story short, here we go. Anyway, we finally got that taken care of. It cost me double my tithing to get things fixed on that and so forth. Double. Just almost to the penny cost me double. Now, I didn't think the Lord should have been quite that harsh. <laughs> but it's an amazing how the Lord said, you know, I said, Lord, I'll tell you what, okay, okay, from now on, from now on, from now on, I'm going to give my tithe to you. And uh, there's, no, there's no cheating. There's no... Uh, withholding here there's no excuses or anything else so anyway i was glad that was over with and i reminded the lord you got caused us a divorce too you know because you you should have told margie to keep her uh to refrain herself i'll put it that way we wouldn't use words like keep your big mouth shut you know but we just use like refrain you just a little bit there you know because that's aggravating you know okay so much for that but there's a battle that goes on isn't there in your life. In many, many areas, there's a battle that goes on. There really is. I have the Holy Spirit. I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. But I still have the old nature that I've had for 23, 24 years. And that old nature, that old nature had controlled my life pretty much so. You know, I did what I wanted to do, what I felt like doing. I just play, plain did it. You know, it didn't matter. I didn't do anything like... <laughs> You know, murder anybody, anything like that, but uh, uh, I didn't really take too much off anybody either, you know. Came home one time, I know I'm not supposed to use too many stories, but uh, here, man, I bought our camera for us here. They said, no, no, don't waste time, we want to hear the Word of God. Well, I'll give you, uh, I'll just give you one more. I'm out hunting, and I'm out hunting. So I'm out there, and uh, I knew where the fence line was. The so rabbit gets up, I shoot the rabbit, the rabbit rolls, but he just crawls under the fence on the other side of the fence. So anyway, I walk over there, and here comes this big long-legged dude out there, and uh, he said, don't touch that rabbit, don't touch that rabbit, that's, that's my rabbit, you're on my property. 
Now I'm on top of the fence, just got over there, you know, and this is only four feet. I couldn't reach it through the fence. So we get over there, and I said, no, it's my rabbit, and we get my rabbit, climb back over the fence, I'm sorry, he run on your property, you ought to be mad at him, not me. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm only over here because he's over here, and I want to get him off your property. So he ended up and gave me a shove, and I headed up and busted him. Well, I got my rabbit and went on, he's still on the ground, and uh, never told Margie. She didn't need to know. <laughs> it wasn't two days later. Here comes the sheriff or the constable down to the house. Now I'm working over right there. And uh, anyway, comes down to the house and uh, says, is your husband home? She said, no, no. He says, well, I have a warrant for his arrest. She says, what's that for? Assault and battery. <laughs> oh, no, no. What did he do? You know, <clears throat> so I come home, she says, okay, what's up, Max? <laughs> What'd you do now? What, what, what's happened now? I said, do a thing, Marge. What's wrong? I have a piece of paper for you. I'm supposed to appear in court in a couple of days. Well, they had the mayor's courts then in the towns, you know, so I had to go to the mayor's court. Well, what did you do? And I said, well, Marge is not going to understand because anything I ever do, if it's somebody else's fault, you always blame me for it. And uh, so we're having a little tiffy tiff here again, you know, we're a little tiff. Did you ever, did any of you, how many of you are married? Did you ever marry? Good. Did you ever have a tiff? What's it called, a little tiff? <laughs> Can't see your hand. Yeah, a little tiff. <laughs> Boy, we got some tiffers and we got some liars. <laughs> 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 That's what we got here. Okay. Uh, but anyway, I went up to court. And the mayor said, uh, I said, Mayor, I got to tell you what happened. I said, there's more to this than what you know. Make a long story short, here we go again. The mayor fined me $15, and the mayor find, found him $5 more than me because he pushed me first, and he admitted that he pushed me first, or I wouldn't have hit him second, you know, because I didn't like to be pushy. So cost him five dollars more and we won't believe this a week or so later he called me and he said you can come out and hunt on my property anytime you want can you believe this <laughs> i'll tell you that's a crazy thing that happened you know but you know what uh i thank the lord that he understands and i've done things that i shouldn't have done and so forth like that as every other christian has but i know one thing all of those things i don't have to worry about just the things that I do since I was saved. And that's enough to worry about right, right there, you know. Okay, well, let's go on down. Here we go. Build upon that foundation and a great battle between the old nature and the new nature. Have you ever been in a position where you feel the Holy Spirit wanted you to do something and the old nature said, well, I don't really feel like doing that or one thing or another, and you're in sort of a little conflict there and you got a little battle going on, don't you? I don't want to hear about it because none of you are going to admit it anyway. But I'm just saying you have had it if you're a Christian. Now, we come over here in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, 17. He says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now he goes on, in verse 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Okay? You can't do the things that you would. So, anyway, I want to bring out something, because here is where one word can make a difference between a false doctrine and a true doctrine. Okay? But it says here, notice the word cannot. Now, I know some of you have already had this before, and you probably already got it in your notes. But if the spirit and the flesh are at war so that, since you're a Christian now, you cannot. That's an absolute. You cannot do the things you want to do. In other words, I'd like to do this, but you're absolutely refrained from it. You'd have to be a robot. You'd have to not have a free will. You'd have to have God take away your free will, even though you don't have the right to make a decision because God's going to refrain you from doing what you want to do by taking away your free will, and which would mean that you would never <coughs> sin again in your life. Because if the Spirit lusteth against the flesh, the flesh against the Spirit, so that you cannot do the things that you would, then what are you doing at the judgment seat of Christ to suffer loss or rewards? 
because if that's in the absolute, no Christian would ever sin after they're saved. So there has to be something wrong. And something wrong is by using a mistranslation. And how do you find that out? You go to look up the Greek word for cannot here. And then you look up the Greek word for cannot that is used in the absolute sense. Like when God says you cannot do this or you cannot go to heaven in these human bodies, that's an absolute. There is no way you're going to take this human body to heaven. So, if you look here, and we've got this in here so that you can have it in your notes and that, the word cannot here in verse 17 is a mistranslation, and the Greek for it is just a M-E. We would say me, but it's pronounced may in the Greek. It's a prime particle of qualified negation, depending upon the context, which means it's not an absolute. <clears throat> now, if you translate it as an absolute, cannot, if you translate it as you absolutely cannot, well then, how would it contradict other scripture? Well, if you go to 1 John chapter 1, speaking to Christians, then God says, if we as a Christian say we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Well, how can we have sin if we cannot sin? If this is a proper translation, but it is not a proper translation. So, they shouldn't have translated it, cannot. Because cannot means absolutely cannot, that's an absolute. It should have been translated. The word cannot is used as an impossibility. A different Greek word is used, and so forth there. It should have been translated, you should not. Therefore, you still have your free will to make up your mind whether you're going to listen to the Holy Spirit or whether you're going to listen to the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. So, there has to be something wrong. They translated it cannot as an absolute. It's a mistranslation, and therefore, it should have been translated the flesh lusts against the spirit, spirit against the flesh, so that you should not. You should not do the things that you would. Therefore, God never took away your free will to make your decision so that you're responsible for who you're going to listen to. I hate for God to make a robot out of me, and if he would do that to everybody so that you absolutely couldn't sin after you're saved, then what are we doing at the judgment seat of Christ? What's that for? How are we going to suffer loss of rewards unless it's for things we didn't do that we should have done? And so forth. Does any of this make sense to you? A little bit? Okay, we can go over, over it when you get home, okay, or <coughs> later. Now, how is there another Greek word that is translated cannot that is properly translated as cannot the way it should? Well, you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 50, and you go there in uh, 15 verse 50, you'll find out over there that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now the word cannot is properly translated, it's an absolute impossibility. Because these bodies that we have right here can never go to heaven because they're a sinful body, cannot enter a sinless heaven. So you can't ever take them to heaven. Little baby, when it uh, dies, that little body there it just looks just like it's just asleep. And you would think, well, I know the body's not alive, but, you know, how can this, this beautiful little baby here can't take its body to heaven? No, the body's dead. No, it can't. Even if that little baby has a sinful body, because you never have to send your child to any kind of training to teach them how to misbehave. Most of you all have children. <laughs> They misbehave naturally, don't they? Don't they sometimes get a little testy, mom and dad? They do that. Sometimes you have to put your foot down a little bit, you know? And that, well, sure. Because even that little baby, and even, you know what amazes me? We have parents in our church here that uh, have had babies pretty recently. Within a year, two years, something like that. And uh, maybe some sooner, 
But what I'm saying is, it amazes me to bring them to church, and these little babies have a will of their own very early in life. I mean, if you don't hug them when they want hugged, they'll cry, throw a fit, and everything else, and scream and everything, and you call it colic, but whatever you want to do, and you're hunting for a little rubber thing to stick in his mouth to shut him up or shut her up, you know, and what in the world's going on, you know. But and isn't it funny that they develop a will and so forth like that? Whew, do they ever. Okay. But anyway, we just wanted to point that out. Also, this mistranslation of cannot in Galatians 5, 17 is the difference between a true and a false doctrine. In other words, if a Christian could never sin after they're saved, then how did they produce the wood, hay, and stubble that they're going to have to give an account for at the judgment seat of Christ? So you see how one little word that's mistranslated is the difference between a false doctrine and a true doctrine because God never takes away your free will because he wants you to love him because he first loved you and he wants you to serve him because he loved you and you have the free will to make that choice of what you're going to do with your life. Now let's go on down. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it and it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now in verse 13, every man's work that is, the good and the bad, shall be made manifest. And here we pointed this out previously in others, that the point is, many say it's just a judgment of rewards, and you're not going to have to be embarrassed by anything or that or so forth like that. I'm not worried about being embarrassed because there's a whole bunch of people who's going to be embarrassed too. So I don't think they're going to be too worried about me as they are worried about what's going to be revealed about them. Amen? So I'm not, I'm not too shook up about that. We've all sinned to come short of the glory of God. Well, uh, but, uh, but since I'm a Christian, still if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth is not in us, because we still have the old nature, and that battle goes on, and not always have we listened to the Holy Spirit, but sometimes we've listened to the flesh to do the things we want to do. Okay, let's go on down. Every man's work, good or bad, shall be made manifest. The Greek for manifest is pleneros. And it means visible, known, openly. This would be contradictory to those who claim this is only a rewarding stand and that the details of the loss of rewards will not surface. That's not true. They will surface. So I'm going to suffer loss of reward. But also, when it says every man's work shall be made manifest, the word manifest means visible, known, and openly along with many other things, it means. But, in the context, that. Now, notice the word fire. It's the Greek word per, just P-U-R. It's used as a noun. What does it mean, tried so as by fire? Well, besides this ordinary natural significance as fire, it is also used to represent the absolute divine holiness and righteousness of God's judgment. I remember we went to Troy Baptist Temple, and uh, after we were saved, and uh, anyway, uh, Dr. Thomas Duff, he lived in Middletown, Ohio, and they had uh, the iron refineries down there. And uh, he used this as an illustration I thought was a good one. He said, you know, uh, he went to those finery, uh, refineries, went through it, and they heat the raw stock of the iron with all of its impurities and so forth, and everything within that is brought to the top, to the surface, when they heat that iron in the raw stock. That leaves the pure iron in that uh, where it can be used, whatever they're going to do with it, you know. And the same thing, he used that as an illustration, which I thought was a good illustration. And you find out that God is not a respecter of persons. He'll also bring to the surface the impurities of a Christian's life which are valued as loss of rewards. He will also do that. So, as we go on, notice the words of what sort it is. Now, being that at the judgment seat of Christ, we find out that it literally means the good or the bad works that is self-explanatory. You see? So, the idea that it's just going to be a rewarding stand and uh, I'm not going to have to... Uh, uh, be confronted with the sins I did after I'm a Christian is a fallacy. That's not true. 
that's going down. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Verse 14. Well, the rewards will vary. As 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8 says. Now, you could write a whole book on this as we go on with the rewards and so forth because it carries on into the millennial reign, carries on into eternity and so forth. And especially in the millennial reign, where it has a lot of significance concerning your responsibilities, how God's going to use you depends upon how that you allow him to use you upon the earth and so forth like that. It's going to be a lot of things. Because there are going to be those that God is going to restrain. There's not going to be any open sin. There won't be any rapes. There won't be any robberies. There won't be anything. This is a time of absolute perfect peace. The animal kingdom will be the same way. You're not going to have the foxes eating the mice and so forth like that. You're not going to have the wolves down there uh, going after their prey or going after the cattle or going after the, uh, uh, the other things to eat and so forth like that. You're not going to have that. It's going to be like it was before the flood. You're going to find out that uh, you can plant your crops and you're not going to have to sit out there with a shotgun like we might have to do around here if things don't change, you know. Well, I'm just sort of using that to an extreme a little bit, you know. But uh, you can plant your garden, your crops and everything else. Nobody's going to destroy them. Nobody's going to steal them, anything else. You can't steal a watermelon. God won't let you do that. You can't steal a pumpkin out of somebody's garden. You can't do that either, you know. And uh, I remember one time I in our garden back of our house. I had this uh, watermelon and I thought I've never had much luck growing too much you know but I had this watermelon and I planted the seed so forth and this watermelon got up about that big. Well this watermelon was supposed to get up about that big. Till I come home there wasn't any watermelon there. So I said Marge, somebody stole our watermelon. Oh no honey, I got it in the refrigerator. I said, well, you got it too soon, honey. Why would you keep your hands off? It wasn't your watermelon to begin with. It was my watermelon. And here we have another tiff. You know, you know all these tiffs. And it is ridiculous. Well, it is ridiculous. And it wouldn't have happened if she got her hands off of my watermelon. It would never have happened, you know. So back to my wife. Okay. But anyway, we come on down and begin to find here that... Uh, Every man, notice here in 1 Corinthians 3, 8, same chapter. Now he that planteth, he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. <clears throat> this is important because one waters, one gives out the word of God, another plants. Maybe you witness to somebody and they didn't want it, but you witnessed to them and so forth. I remember down in Ohio, uh, uh, there was a man down there, one of the deacons in our church down there, and he asked me, he said, uh, so-and-so here is, uh, uh, I witnessed to him and witnessed to him and witnessed to him what anything to do with the Lord whatsoever. Now this can work the opposite of what it worked for him and me. And he said, he's down there, and he's got a girl living with him. He said, uh, uh, he says, he's a wonderful fella. And she's a wonderful girl. They're, they're not married to that, and they don't want anything to do with the Lord. He said, uh, Pastor, will you go down, just give it a shot, but <laughs> you probably won't do any good. So anyway, I said, I promise you, Al, I'll go. So I went down there, knocked on the door, came to the door, and I said, Pastor, the Baptist Church down here, and I said, I uh, just want to got a couple minutes to talk to you. He said, no, not really. And I said, well, I'll tell you this. Uh, uh, before I go, and I will honor your request, I can show you one verse in the Bible that tells you how you can know you're going to heaven and you'll never go to hell. He said, come on in. <laughs> <laughs> that was the craziest thing. And uh, so I went in, led him to the Lord, led his wife to the Lord, and married him. Isn't that amazing? Now, the same thing can happen, because I've had it happen where I've witnessed to somebody two or three times, and then a couple years later, somebody come along and said, you know, I led them to the Lord, and they told me they had never heard the gospel before. Oh, what in the world are you talking about? You got a short memory, you develop amnesia or something? I witnessed to you two or three years ago, and you want anything to do with it now. Now you accept Christ. And you tell this guy he never heard the gospel. Well, all of that is doesn't mean a thing to me. The fact is he's saved. Isn't that the main thing? One person waters, another gets, but each one's going to get their own reward. I'll be rewarded because I witnessed to him. I don't care if he forgot it or not. The Lord don't forget those things. Vice versa and so forth. So, we find out that those things happen, but when he says here, he that planteth, Given, given out first, 
He that watereth, another comes along and gives it out again to the fellow, or wife, whoever it might be. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So each one's going to be rewarded. And another thing to keep in mind is this. And I think I'll get, I've got a couple minutes yet. I think I'll get to that here just after we finish up here just a little bit. Then we find out that Christians will be servants of Christ within the thousand year early reign of Christ. Many Christians will be busy in the millennium with many ways to serve during this time, depending upon their faithfulness here upon the earth here. Others will be standing around doing nothing but watching from the sidelines just as they did on earth. I don't want to get involved, you know. As the old saying goes here, there are Christians that make things happen. There are Christians that watch things happen. And there are Christians that have absolutely no idea what's going on. What's happening? Oh, I didn't know that. Well, no, no, you didn't know that because, you know, you, know, you didn't want to get involved. You know, you didn't have time to get involved. So you don't know. Now, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now, this verse is proof of God's divine righteousness of his word here. For example, if a Christian is in heaven with hardly any good works, he lived his life for the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, according to 1 John 2, 16. So he's more interested, and I'm sure that you know Christians like that. Any excuse they have for not being in church, or not serving the Lord, or not witnessing, or one thing or another like that, they do it. And thank God for other Christians who don't do that. Maybe once in a while, but not all the time, you know, like that. Okay, but the fact is he's still saved or he wouldn't be in heaven at this judgment. That's eternal security. Then you have those self-righteous fools who laugh and denounce and say, Oh, you're once saved, always saved. Where do you get that false doctrine? Well, the problem is it's not a false doctrine, it's a true doctrine. You're trying to go to heaven on your good works part. You're as lost as a goose in a caboose in a Cleveland blizzard. You know, you're lost there. But you'll always have Satan's crowd and his preachers come out with that kind of stuff and when they condemn that you're once saved, always saved, then they're condemning God himself. Because God said, I love the world. I gave my only begotten Son and whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what kind of life? Isn't it everlasting life? So if you can lose your salvation that God has to become a liar. But Romans says, let God be true and every man a liar. And in the middle verse of the Bible, Psalms 118a, better put your trust in the Lord, put confidence in men, isn't it? Absolutely. I don't know how many times I've had a heartache over trusting some dingbat preacher or person who claims to, you know, be such a good Christian and then come out with a mouthful of false doctrine. You know, it's like vomit. Then, we come on down. The problem is, if you can lose your salvation through lack of good words or works, the only way you can get it back the second time is by having good works. Then my question is, why didn't you get it the first time by good works instead of the second time? Because how many good works do you have to have to get saved again if you can lose your salvation by not having good works? That's nothing but lordship salvation, whether you come in the front door or whether you come in the back door. Other words, make Christ Lord of your life, that's the front door. Other words, know you're saved by grace through faith and so forth. But if you don't have good works, then you, you, you're not really saved to begin with, that's the back door. All of this is satanic garbage that is put out in order for Satan to attack God through you because you will not study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, as we go on. And putting this down, and you can read this about the, I should say here, what God has to say about these false teachers. But I fear least by any means as a serpent to God Eve through his subtlety that your so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. How can you get any more simple than believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in Acts 1631? How can you get any more simpler than that? If you can't understand that, you shouldn't be free in society. Amen? No, you should be locked up or have a, have, have a counselor walk with you wherever you go. I wouldn't trust you in a grocery store or anywhere else. 
Because if you can't understand, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, now shall be saved, you're in trouble, sir. You're in big trouble. Then, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end should be according to their works, found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's an amazing thing. Most all workers and satanic preachers will always counterfeit it with, oh, I just love God. I just love God. Sugar wouldn't melt in their mouth. They're just so nice and so humble and all of that. You are a liar out of pits of hell in a human body, sucker. That's what you are. But they'll always put on this, just love God, and so nice, and one thing or another. Let me read this to you here, and a nice little poem or something. So let me read you a good poem, okay? In closing, remember your life is precious to the Lord. Don't waste it. It's the only one you have down here. And as one man said, Mr. Studd, C.T. Studd, said, only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say, twas worth it all. Only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. Jim Elliott made the statement to one of the five missionaries out of Wheaton College that went to, down to Ecuador to try to win the Anca Indians. He said, he is no fool to give what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. One more point in closing is this. Why is the judgment seat of Christ not until after the rapture? There's a reason for that. You lead somebody to Christ, and you go ahead and you die and you're in heaven. But that person that you led to Christ may be leading five, six, 10, 15, 20, 25, maybe 100 people to Christ. But you see, one man waters, one man plants, but God giveth the increase. Even though you're in heaven, you're still getting rewards from that person you led to Christ who's leading other people to Christ. So it would be unfair not to have it after the rapture because what you planted is still reaping for you rewards because you led them to Christ. So God's pretty honest to do that, isn't he? So you might have sowed a lot of seeds that's still taken and uh, still reaping things even though you may not be here. And I remember I just gave you one doctor, M. Marty Hahn. I'd get to him and go give him a hug. And uh, I uh, uh, read a couple of his books, one on Revelation, one on Daniel, and so forth like that. And I thought, for heaven's sakes alive, he's made this so simple. He's made this so simple. And he had a great influence. He had two influences on my life. He was 31 years old, was a medical doctor, and he said, I told the Lord, I don't care what boundaries it crosses, whatever I find, dear Lord, the least I can do is I will never compromise on what I know to be true from the Bible. Boy, I thought, man, there's a medical doctor and do that. Dear Lord, you know, if he can do it, I can do it. I'll never be as smart as him or anything else like that, but there's one thing I can do, and that's not give in to what public opinion is or anybody else here just to get ahead in this world if I find it, dear Lord, I'll make you one promise. If I find it to be true, I'm going to let her fly, and I don't give a dag on where it falls. That's your problem, not mine. You know. And then the second thing he did for me, and he's still getting rewards, because I said, uh, you know, I said not only will I promise to do that, too, but give me the gift. I need a gift, and the only one gift that I really want, I'm interested in. You know Dr. M. R. D. Hahn wrote these books, and I could understand them. If you ever gave me anything, give me the gift to make the Bible simple and easy to understand. I said, please give that to me. It's the only thing I ask you, and I promise you when I get it, I'll give it out, no matter what boundaries it crosses and so forth. 
So the first book I ever wrote was Salvation the Public Invitation. And uh, I was like Dr. M. early on, he said, I never knew I had so many uh, friends on the surface. But so when I took a stand for Christ, they surfaced, and I lost a lot of friends. So I wrote that book, Salvation the Public Invitation, when I came back from Bible college. And uh, Dr. Duff, that was our pastor, led us to the Lord. He would, uh, he would say, now Max, uh, now let me give the invitation at the end. You know, he goes, I give you an invitation just to, you know, trust Christ where you're at. You don't have to come forward or anything else like that. And uh, they always use this like, uh, you can tell a Christian by their works. You're, uh, what do you call it? You're a sub inspector, you're a works inspector, or something like that. So, uh, anyway, I remember coming home and I was asked to speak to Troy Baptist Temple. And they had about three or four hundred people going there at that time. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to shake his thing. I'm getting tired of hearing this. You know, you can, uh, uh, you'll know why they're works. So I started out, I said, now, first of all, all of you deacons here, that I've known for a long time. Uh, don't leave till I get done, will you? Don't don't rush the platform and try to strangle me or anything like that. But my message is going to be on. You can never tell a Christian by the way they live. Woo! Preacher about dropped over in his chair up there. Oh, duff, duff, duff. He about dropped over. And uh, but then we went on to do in Matthew chapter seven. Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Haven't we cast out demons in thy name? Haven't we done many good works? He said, you're workers of iniquity. I never knew you. They were trusting all of their good works to get to heaven. He said, I never knew you at all. You're not related to me. Because you're saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift to God, not of works. They said, man should boast. Now, let me illustrate here, and we are finished this morning here. But it's good to get through the judgment seat of Christ and learn to do a little thing about it. The bill fold is sin. I'm the sinner. Here the hand without sin, that's Jesus Christ. We have a problem. I can't ever go to heaven where he's at unless my sin is paid for. I only have two choices. A first choice is, I'm a good person. I'm, I'm, I'm better than so forth. Everybody going to heaven on their good works or think they are will always pick out somebody worse than them to compare themselves with. Isn't that true? Sometimes we do it after we're saved. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. We do that. But if so and so is going to heaven, well, good night, I'm going to heaven. The Lord said, all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. The wages of that sin is, is uh, death. But the gift to God is eternal, uh, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I'm a sinner. God tells me, Max House, don't go to hell and pay for your own sin. Please don't do that. It's already paid for. 2,000 years ago, here, this hand represents Christ, sinless. He paid for your sin so you don't have to go to hell and do it yourself. All I did was put it in the Bible so preachers can't lie about it. You can read it yourself. I love the world. I gave my only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him, don't you believe that he died on that cross? Could not use your head. Your whole time system stated from Jesus Christ. What is the date? What is the year? It's A.D., isn't it? That's Latin for Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. All time was changed from Jesus Christ. Every time you sign a title, you attest that he was here. Well, then if he was here, why don't you believe he died on that cross and paid for your sins, like the Bible says, instead of some stupid preacher trying to get you to heaven, by giving your money and supporting him and making Christ Lord of your life and everything else, and you're a good person after all. We go sprinkle a few drops of water on your head. You're all right, sir. Yeah, going right straight to hell. <clears throat> I trust Christ as my Savior. He said, I'll take your sin market paid max 2,000 years ago, and I'll take my righteousness and give it to you. Therefore, God hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that I might be made the righteousness of God in him. So I know I'm going to heaven. Because God said, I gave my only begotten son, if you believe in him, that he died and paid for your sins. Two promises. You'll never perish, Max Schultz. You'll never go to hell. But you have everlasting life. So when you leave this earth, I look forward to seeing you up there in heaven. Amen.
Isn't that wonderful? Let's bow in a word of prayer. Okay, here we go. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, why don't you do it with your head bowed and your eye closed? And just for your own privacy, that's all. You don't even have to do that if you don't want to. But just tell the Lord, thank you. I'm going to heaven. You love me. You paid for my sin. I am so grateful that I know I'm not going to hell when I die. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Bless each one here this morning. We thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for the Bible. That we can look into your word and see if people are telling us the truth or lying to us. Because without that, we have no way of making that decision correctly. Thank you. Bless each one here in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Oh,